starts now. Welcome. I'm Dr. Kathy O'Bear with the Center for Transformation and Change. So excited to be back with my friend and colleague, Dr. Becky Martinez. As we continue, this might be our fourth or fifth conversation about dynamics of class and classism. And what can we do inside organizations and maybe as we are working in communities to recognize, raise awareness, begin to dismantle and just shift interpersonal, but particularly policies and practices. And Becky, I just am so excited to keep learning with you and our wonderful guests. Yes. So I, um, again, thank you, Kath, for asking me to be a part of this. It, uh, I continue to learn with each show. Uh, and in between each so. And I am excited to be here with my dear friend and colleague <sighs> and like partner in this work, um, Dr. Sanja Ardwan. Do I, did I pronounce that correctly? You're close. No. You're close. So, I, no, 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 no. But I, um, I want to be at it. When yeah. I, so uh, I say my last name, Ardwan. 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 Okay. Ardwan. okay. There we go. See all the time together and still I, and um what i appreciate about sanja's uh work and who she is in the world is she she, she writes from her soul um and her like brain she uh i mean we can talk about capitalism and all those other things <laughs> um, and she just like she talks about class in real ways and intersecting ways and shows up authentic and um can put out journals and books like nobody that I know. <laughs> and so we're, uh, we're so glad to have you here today, Sanja. So you can um, introduce yourself a little bit. And I think the question that we'll open with after your introduction is tell us a little bit about your class story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Kathy and Becky, for having me. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Sanja Ardwan. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am uh, proudly from uh, the tiny community of Vidrine, Louisiana, which you likely will not find on a map. Uh, it does not have a zip code, nor does it have a red light, uh, but it is where uh, I am from and still call home, even though I haven't lived there uh, in a while. Uh, I um, am a first generation college student who went to a K-12 high school, uh, so that was a, a shift for me um, and being able to pursue higher education was a goal and sort of dream of mine as well as my family's and I've been very privileged to earn degrees from LSU, Florida State and NC State um, and worked as a student affairs um, primarily practitioner uh, for about 10 years before shifting over to the faculty and I've been in a faculty role. Um, teaching and learning and thinking and doing um, higher ed and student affairs work for about seven years um, on this side uh, of the house, uh, on the more primarily um, practitioners or scholar side, but I do sort of identify as a scholar practitioner or pracademic um, and really uh, strive to blend uh, that sort of theory and practice, um, scholarship and practice, those sorts of things. So uh, that's a little bit about what I do. Um, in terms of my class story, so uh, I mentioned I grew up in Vidrine, Louisiana. Uh, it is part of Evangeline Parish because we have parishes in Louisiana, not counties, uh, because we are still under a Napoleonic code, uh, the code of law. So that's a fun fact for y'all. Um, but the parish I'm from is one of the poorest um, parishes or counties uh, in the United States. Um, and so that was sort of the context in which I grew up. Um, not a lot of folks uh, went to college. And so uh, therefore, I thought you went to college for three things, doctor, teacher, lawyer because everybody I knew who went to college um, was in one of those roles. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean everybody uh, in the parish or in my town uh, grew up poor working class. Um, and some of them did based on some of their sort of capital dynamics in terms of social capital, cultural capital, financial capital. Um, other folks had financial capital um, from owning their own business or working offshore or when farm work um, does well or there's good subsidies, uh, those sorts of stuff, there can be some financial components to that um, and financial success. But uh, there might be some other parts that still had them sort of straddle class uh, in different ways. Um, all four of my grandparents uh, worked on the farm. Um, and so varying crops. Uh, my parents had different, what I would call blue collar jobs. My dad was a truck driver for a while. Um, and the majority of um, my time as a child, he worked at a lumberyard. 
uh, as an assistant manager at the local lumber yard. Uh, and so therefore I was also employed by age 10, uh, writing the bills for that lumber yard uh, by hand because he said I had better handwriting than him. And so uh, he paid me a couple of bucks to write the bills every month uh, for the lumber yard. Uh, and then my mom uh, had some administrative assistant positions uh, at some places, the local um, uh, Creasel pole company, if you know what that is. Um, and then when that shut down, uh, she went to a medical office and then she spent most of my childhood working uh, at a gas station slash specialty meats grocery store. Um, so shout out to Teach Grocery in Bill Platt. They have the best specialty smoked meats you will ever eat. Um, it's a little PSA there. Um, and so I grew up uh, in a family that you worked uh, different hours, um, long hours, uh, sometimes sun up to sundown, um, sometimes third, like second shift. Um, my mom worked a lot of late nights at the gas station grocery store um, to having multiple jobs, but also being engaged in your community. Uh, my grandparents are very engaged in their community, really from a collectivism standpoint and then sharing crops with other people from the garden and um, being engaged, like playing cards with people at their house, going visiting, that's what they would call it, I'm gonna go visit. Uh, and then my dad was a volunteer firefighter. My mom volunteered at our local Catholic church. Um, and so there was this um, piece of you also, even though you work hard and you work long hours, you also give back to your community in sort of a collectivist way as well. So uh, I learned a lot of good stuff from that and I learned a lot of bad habits from that as well. <laughs> And learning all kinds of things in these last few minutes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but um, I appreciate the the share, right? So even for me, I'm like, oh, new information. Um, uh, and the late nights, right? Sh double shifts and community piece. Um, and, you know, even as we think about time and, you know, time is a valuable commodity, um, or valuable something, yep. um, being able to, even in all of the exhaustion, which I'm sure they were, mm -hmm. um, still uh, supporting community um, and who they are and what they could do. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because now sometimes I'll talk to my parents and, you know, I'll say, oh, I'm, you know, evaluating student assignments or, you know, I'm doing this or I'm going on this work trip. And my mom was always like, you work too much. And like in my mind, I'm like, who do you think I learned that from? Uh, you know, like I learned that from y'all. And um, and so, and I think what I struggle with from like a, a class traveling perspective on that is that I don't view my work as hard because it is not physically laborious, right? Like I'm not carrying pieces of wood and I'm not, my mom used to have to carry really heavy boxes like to restock the grocery store, right? And so um, I'm not necessarily physically tired um, and my, my work is not physically laborious. And so I don't, I view it as it's, well, it's not that hard. Of course I can do it for longer because it's not that hard. Yes. And we may come back to exhaustion, burnout, yep. um, especially with folks. What I, I'm excited to learn with you on a number of reasons, and particularly you're focused on first generation, poor, working class, rural mm -hmm. students. And I didn't know how cross race your community was. But one reason I'm excited to talk is when we talk classism, I think particularly white folk think folk of color, indigenous folks, we've intersected poor, and I think that's part of racism. Yep. What I was hoping you would also talk about was the invisibility of white poor, particularly first gen, and in organizations and hiring and higher ed. So um, just yeah. what do you think? And I'm not saying either or, but I just think there's an invisibility, just like your town wasn't on the map. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and much less the stereotypes of poor white working class folk in rural areas. Um, so I know that's like ten questions in there, but that's <laughs> yeah. like I want to learn so much with you yeah. today. Yeah, I think I'm following though, Gabby. I think so. To speak to sort of the racial dynamics of where I'm from, uh, it is uh, folks who identify as black, folks who identify as white, uh, and then folks who would identify as biracial, multiracial, and or Creole. Uh, and so Cajun and Creole are sort of uh, different sort of components. Uh, so Cajun, um, I would say, is sort of more of an ethnic group, and that occurs across race. Uh, mm -hmm. Most folks who identify as Creole, um, it's um, most of those people would identify as people of color. Um, and so there is both an ethnic component and a racial component uh, to their to that as well. So um, some folks, if you met them in my hometown, wouldn't say they're biracial or multiracial, they would say I'm Creole. Uh, and so that is sort of how they're defining that. But 
um, outside of sort of black, white, and, and folks who are bi or multiracial or Creole, uh, there weren't a lot of other folks who identified in different ways. That We had a couple of folks we went to high school with, like I could probably name them on one hand, uh, who um, identified as indigenous or with uh, different um, native communities uh, that were sort of in the you know, general area where we lived in Louisiana, um, because there are um, the Cushada tribe and uh, one other tribe that are in that area. And so thinking about uh, what did that mean? And so often um, it was interesting as a kid, and I don't know that I could have named this as a kid, but uh, the sort of how race and class mixed together. Um, and because my family talked about both in different ways, sometimes in coded ways, sometimes in direct ways. Um, but I always sort of knew that being white got me different opportunities in my community and at my school, even though uh, I came from more of a working class background, right? So I knew there was a distinction around class based on how I felt that. Um, but then I, it was also clear to me there was a distinction around race uh, based on sort of some of the practices, um, racist practices, if we're going to be clear about that, uh, that happened in my high school. Um, a lot of the uh, young black men in my school um, got trapped into special ed. Uh, and then uh, they basically had PE all day and then they were on our basketball team and we were really good. Um, and so there were interesting dynamics to some of those things we had uh, earlier in my time as a child, there were two homecoming queens, right? There was a black homecoming queen and a white homecoming queen. Um, and that, so there was a racial piece there, but there was also a class piece there because often folks who were from families like mine weren't on homecoming court, right? Like we couldn't have afforded it. We wouldn't have been voted that way uh, because of some of the class dynamics that showed up. So it was and how people where people lived, even though it was a rural community, who owns land, who has the ability to sell land, who are they selling that land to or not to uh, based on some of the both the race and class dynamics there. So I think um, it showed up in all kinds of ways and um, was less hidden. And then it was interesting because later in life, I moved to Boston uh, and people think Boston is like this ex extraordinarily racially diverse city, which it, it is if you look at the numbers, right? But then if you start to look at neighborhoods uh, and where people live and how people are coded, um, like, oh, you live in that neighborhood, this must mean this about you, uh, related to both race and class dynamics. Um, and when I was in college, there was some of that as well, because uh, I went to LSU and uh, a lot of the folks, no, uh, more of them were from cities than from rural areas. Uh, and uh, if you are from the city of New Orleans or any of that surrounding area, uh, the first question is always, where did you go to high school? Even if you've earned multiple college degrees and like those sorts of things, they are sort of coding you um, based on the name of your high school. So um, that didn't bode well for me as a college student because nobody knew me during high school. Right. And so um so again, to the invisibility point you're talking about there is uh, who is known and who is not known and why, um, I think are some important components to think about. I think the other piece to what you're saying, you know, first gen and rural and working class, uh, the other piece, I think when we think about sort of poverty and white folks uh, is also around region, right? I think there's a different narrative around poor Southern white folks uh, mm -hmm. than there would be about you know, poor white folks in Montana or, um, you know, in other, in Vermont or, you know, other parts of the country that are, uh, no, you know, noticeably whiter. Um, and particularly because I think in the South as well, we often associate poverty, um, with, we conflate poverty and race uh, in some respects. And for some people that's true, um, the combination is true. And for some people it is not um, because rurality is not just white. Uh, go to rural Mississippi, right? Go to rural Texas, go to rural California, you know, places in rural North Carolina uh, that are um, predominantly people of color who are um, who are in rural spaces. And so thinking about some of those things, too, I think has been interesting in my life, but then also from a research perspective and some of the work we're trying to do around rurality. I mean, even when we um, think class, right, or we think um, poor, we don't often, like, we go to poor urban Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and like rural isn't even part of the subject matter or thinking or engaging. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, and I know that, you know, given your story and given your research and given your like passion and, and need. Um, talk a little bit about what like what would be some ways that we could uplift having conversations around um, the intersection of rural and poor. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, people assume, well, there's not a lot of people there, so it's not a big issue. Right. But if you look across the country, right, uh, um, more of it is rural than urban. Um, and so thinking about uh, what does that sort of mean and look like? And I think to not make the assumption that 
rural people never leave rural communities. Um, some of them want to go back. I think that's the other challenge too, is that there's a same way there's like an upward mobility bias around social class in sort of higher ed spaces. I think there is a you got out mentality around rural mm. spaces that people make the assumption people don't want to go back um, or they question uh, why people do it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so thinking about and we don't tell people what it means that they might not be able to. So like, I don't think anybody ever said to me, hey, guess what? If you get these certain degrees or whatever, it's going to be really hard for you to ever go home. Like nobody ever said that to me. They just made the assumption that I didn't want to. Um, and so there's, there's never, was never sort of a recognition or realization of what you're giving up. Um, and in some ways I've been able to recreate that. Now I do live sort of in a, what I would consider a rural town. That's the other, I think, complicating factors who were asking to define rural, what measures we're using or like quantitative or qualitative, like all of those pieces. But my thing is, and some of the rural so sociology research supports this is it's a know it when you see it concept. So I'm always like, come to Dallas, North Carolina and tell me it's not rural. Right. Um, and so I think that that's part of the complicating factor too. Um, I was at a, um, a, a event a couple weeks ago, uh, talking to some educators and legislators in North Carolina. And one of the things I sort of called to question was how the UNC system is defining rural because it's a SES metric. It's actually not a rural metric. Um, and so then, uh, some places that get skewed, right? So the County where, um, Appalachian state, where I work is in, is Watauga County, where there are two affluent cities in that County. One is Boone where App State mm -hmm. is, the other is Blowing Rock, which is more of a sort of retirement, um, vacation-y type of community, well, their SES skews the rest of the county. Um, and so even though the county is rural, it's not being served by some of these policies and practices related to rurality because they're using conflated metrics. Um, and we can point that out on a federal, like we can point that out on lots of levels. Um, I think higher ed institutions are paying more attention. Uh, there are more positions that we're seeing in sort of enrollment management and admissions offices that are to recruit rural students. And that even at places that are really urban. So Wash U in St. Louis was one of those institutions that um, is hiring somebody to specifically focus on rural communities and areas. Now, that's more so probably from a business imperative than a moral imperative. Uh, but regardless, right, I think sometimes those business imperatives are what get people to pay attention. And so I think the 2016 election made people pay more attention to rural America, um, but also made them made sort of a narrative that rural America is white, uh, which is, again, not, it's not a monolithic, rurality is not monolithic. Um, and I think, um, how do we complicate that narrative around morality, just like we're trying to complicate the narrative around social class and what that means and looks like. So, um, so I think about a lot of those things when I think about rurality. And I think about, um, you know, there's similar challenges, like the local high school near where I live, um, there was a, a gun issue uh, at the high school recently. And so people sometimes think, well, that doesn't happen in rural areas. Yes, it does, right? Like there are still, there's significant um, addiction uh, challenges in rural areas. And so um, how are we sort of paying attention and providing resources uh, to those folks as well? Because if we want to create a sort of civically engaged populace, uh, giving folks access to learning, whether or not that's higher ed, right? That might be um, some other, apprenticeship, like some other form of learning, um, but giving people access to that, I think is really important. You know, as I hear you, Sanja, I love it. And the stereotypes that I grew up with about folks who were poor, maybe working class was a little less derogatory. Um, so I'm having wonders about, we can have a position at a university that says we want to recruit and yeah. just like we did similar with students of color across class, the retention. So what I'm wondering is how do we prepare staff, faculty, and if people are listening, then you might be K-12, you might be in nonprofits, you might be in corporations. How do we prepare folks to understand the bias, the stereotypes to interrupt it? And then there might be some policies and practices that are just set up to continue to privilege folks from middle-class backgrounds uh, if not upper middle class. Um, so again, five or six questions, but I'm curious because I don't think we're prepared in higher ed K-12 to support folks from rural areas across race, um, particularly poor and working class, but I could be wrong. No, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think that, um, you know, sometimes we create structures for more access. I'm not going to say complete access because I don't think it is, but we create structures for more access, but we don't pair them with supports for success. And that occurs, I think, at every level, right? 
uh, PK-12 teachers in rural areas who have differential resources than, you know, teachers who are at private high schools um, in major cities or anywhere, really, um, or folks who are saying, well, we go, we go and recruit, like colleges, we go recruit in rural areas, um, but then we have no supports on campus for folks to meet other people who are from rural areas. We did some research recently, and we're in the process of writing this up for publication, but um, Ty McNamee, who's at uh, Teachers College Columbia, sort of led that project, and uh, some of the students that we interviewed, rural students said, you know, one student particularly was talking about, you know, I'm a, um, I identify as a black woman from a rural area. I'm 0.01% of the population on my campus. Um, and so how is that student meeting other people who share some of their experiences and identity and perspectives? Um, because another student, for example, um, gave a quote around, uh, I met other folks from rural areas and I finally felt like a sense of like connection and ability mm. to see myself in this space. And I thought about that for myself as a student. Some of the people I had the best relationships with in college that I met were from other rural small towns in Louisiana who are from working class families. And that happened across race. Um, and so because we connected over, we could have the conversations about race. And um, I'm thinking particularly about uh, my friend, her name is Lakia Jones. Uh, and we would often have these intense conversations about race and then connect over how our rural working class backgrounds or led us to very similar sort of perspectives or outcomes or those sorts of things. So, um, so having those structures in place to support students, or you may say, well, you know, we're closing the residence halls for break or whatever. Well, that's a social class issue, but it's also a, like a geographic issue because what if you live mm -hmm. further and you don't have the ability, especially if you're from a rural area and you're a working class student, uh, how are you getting home? Like, what does that mean and look like for you? And some institutions are starting to think about those things and starting to put new policies and practices in place. And some just aren't, right? They're worried about getting people in the door to say they have them, but they're not necessarily worried about uh, the type of experience they're having while they're there. Um, some institutions, again, differently than others. Uh, Community colleges have been doing this for a really long time. And so what can we learn from community colleges? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes our four-year institutions get into their egos about we don't have anything to learn from two-year institutions. And sometimes two-year institutions have been doing it longer and are maybe have scalable practices that we can uh, utilize at four-year institutions. And I think the same is true for organizations and corporations, right? So maybe you're going to recruit folks from different geographic areas, but um, you don't want them to work remotely. And so what if they want to live in that rural area and your company is in San Francisco or Atlanta or wherever? Um, and so do you have policies in place that would allow you to include more people from sort of different geographic areas or different social identity backgrounds um, and, and benefit your institution or your organization while still living maybe where they want to live in, in that in a rural community? And so I think there are lots of policy and practice things as we think about sort of shifting dynamics in the workforce, uh, both at higher ed institutions and at other corporations and organizations. Um, if we want to recruit and retain people, how are we creating policies and practices that invite them to be who they are and where they want to be um, and still contribute uh, to the purpose, mission, mission uh, responsibilities of the organization? Mm. Well, you know, and I think even um, like needing to deal with our internalized like stereotypes of like um, rural and poor and working class and what does that mean? Because there's all kinds of like stuff yeah. connected with, um, you know, the way that people may have implicit bias and not even recognize it, whether it be around, oh, this is where you're from or this is how you sound yes. right? or this is how you got your degree. and um, or where you got your degree and how do we like really talk about that in like authentic ways without it being shameful or embarrassing um, and be like, yep, I'm holding this bias and that's something that I've got to work on. Yeah, I appreciate it. I think of a specific example a couple weeks ago, I was back up in Boston um, and we were checking at the hotel and I was talking to the um, the desk attendant at the hotel and uh, he asked me where we were coming from. And I said, oh, we're coming from North Carolina. And he was like, I knew it was somewhere in the South. And it was, it was such a moment for me because I lived in Boston. I got that a lot when I lived in Boston, like, oh, you're from somewhere in the South. And for me, I'm like, Southern accents are distinct. Like I can tell you somebody from South Georgia compared to Louisiana, compared to East Texas, but that's because I've lived in that region, right? Versus as he was speaking, my first thought was, oh my gosh, you must originally be from Boston uh, based on his accent, right? And so it was this interesting moment of, what assumptions are we making about people based on their accent, their dialect, their word choice, like all of those sorts of things? Because I did, and when I moved to Boston, have um, some anxiousness around, 
uh, I'm going to talk and people are going to automatically know where I'm from and they're going to make assumptions about that. Um, and I don't think as I walk around in, in my day, right, in the world that people assume I come from a working class family. Like, I don't think they assume that. Um, and so, and then I will say certain things and they're like, oh, wait, right? Like you can see there's dissonance uh, in what they're assuming about me, either based on what I'm wearing or how I'm talking uh, or where they met me or how they know me, right? So do they know me at the local bar over a beer or do they know me in the classroom as their professor? And so that is really interesting too, in terms of contextualization and the assumptions we make. Mm. So much to come back from break and continue digging into. Would you mind letting people know how to find you in case they would love further conversation, invite you to come speak at their organization, help them dismantle classism directly? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, folks can uh, find me via email. So it is my name, Sanja Ardoin, S-O-N-J-A-A-R-D-O-I-N at gmail.com. I also have a website that is www.sanjaardoin.com and on Twitter at Sanja Ardoin is my handle. Can't wait till we come back to more Transformation Change Radio. We'll see you all on the other side of the break. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. All clear, ladies. Are you ready to experience full body system wellness? Tune in to the Empower Me Show with Pam Bright, a spiritual toolbox for your life. Embrace the fullness of who you are as a spiritual being having a human experience. Pam Bright is a multidimensional healer, light language channel, energy intuitive, and spiritual transformation coach. Join her for a rich conversation about how to unlock all your spiritual gifts on Transformation Talk Radio. Are you having difficulty feeling at home in your own home? Join Annette Rigolo and Dr. Pat in Enlightened Environments, Optimizing from the Outside In, as they present a deep dive into the various vibrations of the earth, along with man-made energies that impact our lives. Using the diamond dousing method, we will utilize specific vibrations to elevate our own homes to support us and expand us with their energy. Join us every third Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time to make your home home. It is time to get inspired to take action in your life. Tune in to Emotional Elevation with me, Susan Denae. We are identifying, understanding, and treating our crazy one episode at a time. We all have crazy in our lives. The thing that sets us apart is how we deal with it. And I've got you covered. Enjoy your journey. You are worth it. Visit SusanDenae.com. That's D-E-N-E-E dot com. Illuminate your inner framework now with Shelly Hoffberg and Stephanie Salt on the show Intuitive Diagnostics on Psychic Horizons. For you to find the keys to your highest path, it is vital that you see what is happening within your inner metric of you and those around you. They'll help you utilize soul architecture so that you can unravel the highest plan of life actualization for you. Manifest your unique life mission now every Thursday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Are you ready to get big and live your life out loud? Tune in to Get Big Out Loud Radio, exploring life through the lens of curiosity and compassion. With me, Carrie Knudsen, joining Dr. Pat live every second Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. I will offer ideas to transform what you are thinking into conscious action. If you want to get big and live your life out loud, visit me at KnudsenSpeaks.com. Are you wondering who you are meant to be in this ever-changing world right now? Kelly Kay is a certified new paradigm, multidimensional transformation energy healer, ready to assist you in this transformative process of expanding your consciousness. She helps you transmute your wounds and traumas into healing, growth, and wisdom, resulting in self-empowerment and freedom from fear. Visit enlightenedmedicine.com to learn more. You ladies all ready to come back? All right, stand by. Yep. Hang on, here we go.
wonderful welcome back. We're, um, we had a great break conversation um, and we're gonna continue to um, engage with Sanja, especially as we think about, uh, you know, we had ended with rurality and um, geography and, you know, accents and dialect. And, um, you know, what are some of those implicit biases that folks may hold or do hold um, as we think about um, what we just talked about? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I mentioned sort of the get out mentality, right? So folks um, assume that you were like the chosen one, right? Like, oh, you were able to get out or, oh, you left or, uh, you know, all of those sorts of things, which uh, I think are really complex for the people who are being deemed that um, because they may not you know, want to get out or they may not feel like they're exceptional or special or, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and I think it also creates some dynamics around um, creating what the literature would call dual alienation, right? So you don't feel like you're completely fit in your hometown anymore. Um, and I've been told, oh, you know, why you don't talk about us no more? Why are you always so dressed up? You know, all of those sorts of things. So you're sort of um, ostracized size in a bit from your home community, uh, but then your sort of new space, whatever that is, right, your business, your organization, your higher ed institution also doesn't fully sort of understand or get your perspective or where you're coming from. And so you're sort of still an outsider there too. And so it leaves you sort of in this limbo, uh, luminal space that is, is really interesting to navigate. Um, I think that folks also assume that like, maybe you have not had any experiences. And so, you know, like, you know, you don't know anything about sort of music or the arts or like all, and there's amazing sort of artistry and um, in rural communities, there's a, a book called Appalachian Reckoning uh, that I read recent, like a couple of years ago. And uh, it was all about uh, diverse people in rural areas and how uh, they are poets and artists and uh, musicians and all, you know, all kinds of artistic based things. But uh, folks, I think, look at rurality and assume um, farming they assume mining or other kinds of extraction um, and they assume sort of like des desolate, right? Um, and rural areas can be beautiful and engaging and, you know, organized around collectivism and activist communities and, you know, all of those sorts of things too. So I think there's a, an a assumption about lack, um, a lack of opportunity, a lack of interest, uh, just a lack. Um, when often I think of my rural community as vibrant uh, in all kinds mm. of ways. Um, and no, maybe there wasn't, you know, a movie theater within an hour, or there wasn't a mall within an hour, or there wasn't, you know, all of those sorts of things. But um, in other ways, it, you know, mom and pop shops and restaurants and folks know your name and there's mm -hmm. a, a vibrancy to that as well. Um, I think there's also uh, perceptions, like I said, that most people in rural communities are poor um, or working class. And uh, there is a, a town not far from the town I live right now where, um, you know, I get like emails from Zillow or whatever from when I uh, was house searching and all of the houses in that area are over a million dollars. Um, and so it is a sort of a rural community that has been created as almost as an enclave uh, for affluent folks. Um, and so like, what does that mean? Um, and so I think there's these interesting sort of assumptions, both around sort of a deficit or lack um, and this conflation of different identities that rural means white or rural means poor or rural means this. Um, and that may or may not be true. Um, and it may be different for different people who live in that same rural community as well. And so thinking about what that means and looks like, um, and some rural areas are vacation destinations, right? So there are places in Western North Carolina where I live now that, um, you couldn't buy, like it's nobody could buy a house. Like there's no inventory, but then also like it is really expensive because people are using it as like a second home or, you know, all of those sorts of pieces as well. So, um, I think those are interesting. I think there's also an assumption that there is, uh, no opportunity. And so thinking about, um, what is what does that mean and look like in terms of education or jobs or all of those pieces? And so, you know, I am a rural first gen working class student, but there are also folks where I grew up who are definitely not first generation college students. Their parents were the doctor in town or they were the lawyer in town. And so uh, understanding, again, that you can't make these assumptions that this equals that, uh, because while that is my story and that is true for me, that is not true for everybody um, that I went to high school with or college with. And then I even think about my uh, partner, his uh, cousin is a first generation college student, uh, but his uncle owns his own roofing business. And that's a good business in sort of the Northern Virginia area. And so she, uh, while she's a first generation college student, she is not really from, um, she wouldn't identify as coming from a working class background because 
finances weren't an issue. Uh, her parents were part of sort of these community organizations where social capital wasn't an issue. And so um, there are some interesting distinctions there as well. So I think in short, I guess what I'm saying is people should get to know people uh, and sort of hear their <laughs> stories and learn who they are and not make assumptions um, about, you know, if you're rural and you're also working class or then you're also a first gen student or, you know, that's true for some people and for other people, that's absolutely not their story. And as you talk about deficit and lack of resources and access, I think folks like me who grew up more middle class, if not upper middle class, also did at the individual level. You're rural, you are then deficit, you are not as smart, you're not as developed, you're not as capable. And so being a laborer and serving us in our Asheville upper middle class community is what your role in life is and get back in your place. My fear is, as you were talking, I was like, I wonder what the percentage you may know of folks who are faculty and staff in higher ed that come from more of a middle, upper middle class background who might also have biases, who then see their job as let me help these rural students, assuming they're all poor, that whole pull yourself by your bootstraps, but that deficit mentality that whites do with all folk of color, indigenous folk, my fear is around all folk that are rural, cross race, cross class background, still is that deficit, we're here to help you, that patronizing savior mentality. So what do you find in your experience, research, and more? How do you help folks like me still at universities shift so that we're useful and not replicating classism? Yeah. And I think to, to your point, Kathy, I think that happens uh, around social class. I also think that happens around morality. And neither of them, I would argue, we have good data on uh, at an institutional level. And so so uh, the challenge being that our social class marker in higher ed is Pell eligibility, um, and that only applies to undergraduate students, number one. Uh, you can't get Pell if you're not an undergraduate student. Uh, number two, um, it is a limiting marker because not everybody can complete a FAFSA, uh, into, or FAFSA, however you say the acronym. Um, not everybody can complete one because they may not have the information from their families. They don't want to give it to them. They might be somebody who is undocumented or a DACA student. They might be an international student. Uh, and so none of those folks would qualify for Pell because they wouldn't have completed the FAFSA or they're not eligible to complete the FAFSA or those sorts of things. So I would say that when we look at Pell eligibility, it's about 33% across the country. And I would argue that's a, a, a bottom baseline, right? Like that is the lowest amount. So we likely have more than that third um, who, uh, at least undergraduate students who identify um, as coming from foreign working class backgrounds. And so, and that's just the financial piece. That's not looking at all the other pieces of social class. So it's also a very narrow view to just finances and not sort of the broader holistic nature of social class either. And then when it comes to rurality, we really don't have data. I mean, we can look at like county level data or zip code data, um, but there's limitations to some of that as well. And that is not as sort of publicized by institutions, right? They're not, they may say we have students from X counties in our state or X states or X countries or like those sorts of things, but they don't necessarily disaggregate the data in ways that truly show these positions to sort of track that, um, but we don't really have great data there either. So I don't know that people always know, um, even first gen, we're using different definitions, right? So um, the Center for First-Gen Student Success put out some research around there saying, you know, here are some of the common definitions. There were about seven or eight uh, that definitions they're using. But then if you're comparing, right, you're not comparing the same things because people are using different definitions. Uh, and there was a study that Rob Takushin and some other folks at UGA did that they took the same sample of students uh, and applied different definitions of first-gen. And the range of students who were identified as first-gen went from 22% to 50%. No, 22% to 77%. It was no. a 55% margin of error. Um, and so all that to say, we don't have good data. And I think people still make assumptions, right? So if a student's writing a paper and they mention their home community or they raise their hand in class and share an example about, you know, in an engineering class about fixing a motor on a tractor, that's going to land less well than a student mm -hmm. who talks about fixing a motor on their parent's sports car or their sports car or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have heard from some students uh, in our research about how I don't engage as much in the classroom or maybe don't join things or, you know, I'm having challenges in terms of social connection and engagement uh, because people don't get me, right? Like I try to share and I try to engage and it either doesn't land well or people don't have any idea what I'm talking about or they don't value sort of the skills and 
and perspectives I bring, they sort of treat them as less than. Um, and so I think it's a matter of for um, employees at Institute thinking about uh, how do we rearrange our understanding of what is valuable uh, mm -hmm. and how, and, and that is structural, right? So thinking about uh, do we make comments on students' papers or assignments or those sorts of things, but it's also how do we code things with award um, criteria or scholarship criteria or all of those sorts of things as well um, to say, oh, well, that's not as valuable, right? Like you worked on your parents' farm or in your parents' business or whatever, and that's not as valuable as if you were on the debate team or that you, you know, did whatever. And so how are we looking at it from a skills-based um, uh, perspective versus just a title or like something we are more familiar with perspective? Mm. Oh my goodness. That is, <laughs> that is the system right there. As I think about that. And even, um, you, you know, even around language, one of the things that I have appreciated, uh, Sanja will share stories with me, um, as an academic, uh, yeah. and the resistance to even using the language poor. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, you know, sh she has been told like, you can't use this word. How come and what? <clears throat> yeah, so I, it's been fascinating. So um, earlier in my writing, as I was writing about this, folks were like, you know, it's, it's just crass. Like, it's like not language. You should like the word for is like crass and you shouldn't use that. And uh, and I pushed back on that and was like, no, nah, like here are all the reasons. Um, and even after we've sort of established that language, right? Like Becky and I wrote a book, like we wrote another book. I wrote some other stuff and we wrote some chapters together. But the um, reviewers, um, whether it's reviewers for conference proposals, uh, reviewers for journal articles, reviewers for book chapters, et cetera, um, will come back and basically say like, literally, they will say like, you, the person who's proposing this must not know anything about social class if they're going to use the word poor. Um, and so uh, sometimes like there's nothing you can do about it. Like the proposal is just rejected because the reviewers have that perspective. Um, and then other times we've sort of pushed back and said, hey, like, here's why we're using the language. Here's why it's appropriate. Like nobody who grew up poor doesn't know that they grew up poor, but you know, people know um, it's not, you know, um, I sort of liken it to, and it's not the same, but like, if we can't say the word black, we can't talk about race. If we can't say the word queer, we can't talk about sexuality. Right. Um, and if we can't say the word poor, we really can't talk about social class. Um, and some of the feedback has been, well, it makes people uncomfortable. And my question always is which people, <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think, you know, it, it's similar to some of these bills in the legislature right now. They're talking about divisive concepts, like divisive for who? Um, and so I think that that's interesting to sort of think about. Um, and even to the point where I had a chapter um, that I wrote that uh, they changed the language in the editing process. I changed it back to say, hey, no, like this is the language I want to use and here's why. Um, and when it, I got the printed copy, the printed book, the chapter was wrong. They changed my language, uh, which is problematic for a number of reasons. One, because now if people cite it, they're going to cite it incorrectly. That's not what I actually mean. Uh, but two, it feeds into the narrative that it's not okay to use. And they're okay with the term working class. It's the term poor. They want to change to low income. And I say, those mean different things, right? You can be low income and be poor. Uh, you can be poor perhaps sometimes and not be necessarily low income, maybe, but like, so they're not, you know, it's not a synonym. Um, and so they mean different things in terms of narrowness or more broad. The arrogant sense of entitlement mm -hmm. and power that is in hierarchical editors who can select conferences. And so, um, huh. Yeah, so I would say we need some training if we people can't even say the word poor. <laughs> right. So that's what I'm wondering, Becky. We just have a little bit left. I'm wondering about what is possible. What have you seen happen? And I know, Becky, you're doing a lot more work on dismantling classism as well than anybody else I know as a consultant and trainer. And so what can we do in organizations to look at individual bias, behaviors, as well as systemic practices, culture, just what is needed. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to hear Becky's perspective on this as well. I, I think one is having people literally talk about it, like talk about, say the words for, say what you associate with the word for, like literally just put it out there in the world, like naming all of those things. Like, why are you afraid? Like, why are you afraid to say this word? Uh, why are, why might be we have, be afraid to uh, see or approach or talk to folks who are housing insecure, right? Or identify as homeless. Uh, what does that mean? You know, why 
uh, are we afraid to talk to a student about the fact like when they say to us, Hey, I can't afford this textbook for class. Do we just say, Oh, I'm sorry. Like, you know, figure it out. Do we assist them with that? Um, I, there's been an issue uh, that I've been um, managing or trying to help with um, on my campus that um, there was a student who uses EBT. Uh, so like government assistance with food. Um, and they tried to use their EBT card on campus and couldn't. And we asked some questions about why, and it's because the university had never asked for the number you need to be able to use it on campus, um, which is seemingly simple. Um, but then they were like, oh, we need a separate uh, swipe. You can't swipe with a regular credit card swipe for EBT card. You have to have a special swipe. Uh, and so it seems that the university will be able to do that. But what does that mean for the student who goes to swipe and somebody notices, oh, it's swiped in a different card. And maybe they don't say anything or maybe that doesn't happen, but there's always these distinctions. Um, and so thinking about how are we pushing for some of these things? Um, because sometimes people don't even realize it. I don't know if it was an assumption that nobody on our campus needs it. I don't know if it's that nobody shared their story before and trying to use it and not being able to. Um, but how are we talking about it more? Because then we can see where the gaps are and we can see where the classism has showed up or this ignorance has showed up um, or lack of knowing. Uh, and we can address some of those things. I think some campuses want to do it and organizations want to do it. They have a desire or at least they're beginning to. Um, but I think we have to start by talking about it because if we don't talk about it and have no awareness, we can't ever get to the structural pieces. Yeah. And, um, and I think that that's what I've been, uh, Kathy and I have talked about in some shows, right? It's the, like, we gotta be able to name it. Like if we can't name it, then we can't engage it at any level. And there's so much like discomfort and shame and embarrassment or lack of language or lack of knowing. Um, and so, you know, institutions are, um, you know, they'll have full tuition um, for four years if students meet a particular or students like their family's income is, you know, at a particular level. And so we're bringing all of these students in, but we're not talking about it. Uh, and so they feel left out, not connected. Or we're bringing even faculty and staff and administrators in, assuming that they come from middle class backgrounds, uh, because we don't talk about that. And if we, you know, once we can talk about it, then we can be clear, then we can see where the gaps are, right? Better understand where the gaps are. So then we can say, oh, EBT card, we hadn't even thought about that. And we can say, we messed it up. But, you know, organizationally, that's really difficult because then it's like, oh, and then, you know, connected to, you know, white supremacy and perfection and needing to have all of the answers. And so then it gets messy. So then we won't talk about it. But like, just say, you know what? We didn't know. Yeah. Um, and how like and, and that's deep work, I think, for individuals that are in, like for a VP to say that. Whew, yeah. yeah. Right. So like, how are we coaching even faculty and staff when a student bring something to them to say, okay, let's sit down and talk about this, but I don't have found any information or skills or knowing that mm -hmm. I'm going to do exactly what Sanja said is say, oh, uh, sorry, and, and leave it at that and not do anything um, for forward movement. Yeah. And I think as you're talking about the other thing that um, came up for me was uh, I think about a specific instance when I worked at Boston University, um, we, we assume certain employees on campuses come from certain social class backgrounds, right? Um, and so people might assume, right, that folks who are on grounds crew or custodial staff or those sorts of things are coming from poor and working class backgrounds. And we might assume that uh, upper level administrators, faculty are coming from middle to upper class backgrounds. And I remember an uh, instance when I was at BU that um, that distinction was flipped because one of our um, custodial staff members in our building actually had her PhD, but it was from another country. And so the United States was not recognizing her PhD, but in terms of other forms of capital now, it shifted based on what country she was in. But um, I don't know that she would have defined herself necessarily as coming from a working class background because in her in her country that she came from, it, it was not, right? Like she had a PhD, she had this job, she came from sort of a, a more affluent family versus I had come from this working class family in rural area and I was the faculty member. And so the institution wasn't set up to support either of us uh, in sort of how we were experiencing the environment and the culture um, and those sorts of things. And so again, the assumptions we make about who's coming from where and what identities they hold, uh, I think can be um, really interesting and incorrect. And as soon as somebody realized she has a PhD, all of a sudden she got treated better, probably from some of the other. I wonder if we can 
be looking at some of the structural shifts around dismantling racism to see if there's any um, employee resource group or affinity groups. Work with folks who grew up and, and or currently have class privilege to work our privilege in accountability groups. Um, the same kind of questions we ask when we're using a race lens. How is this impacting across racialized identity? Who's getting under privilege? I wonder if there's similar questions. And so listeners may be going, I don't know anything about, but I think we know a lot about beginning to question and dismantle um, undeserved discrimination, bias, and policies and practices that only serve people in privileged groups. So listeners, just breathe. I don't think it's as hard as some of us might be making it up. We know a lot. Um, and whiteness and class privilege are so, I'll bet, ingrained as well that um, that might be another conversation. We just have a couple minutes left. So just anything else you would like to just leave as parting thoughts? And then also, how can people find you? Because I think both of y'all are going to get calls about come help us understand class, talk about it, and then do systemic change. So, yeah, uh, the last sort of piece uh, I want to mention is uh, if you are uh, job searching, if you are hiring people uh, in a search process, uh, be transparent uh, about some of those class components that show up uh, in job searches, whether that is if you expect people to wear a specific thing, tell them that you expect them to wear a specific thing and then think about what that means, uh, that you're telling them that they should be wearing a specific thing. Uh, but then I also think about how are we transparent about what salaries are? How are we transparent about what cost of living is in the area? Um, and then how are we transparent in the negotiation process? Um, um, I didn't negotiate in my probably first three or four job searches, and that has cumulative impact. Um, I didn't know I could negotiate. I was uncomfortable negotiating. I didn't see a need to negotiate uh, because I was making more money than my parents had ever made combined, and I didn't know that you could make more money than that. I mean, I guess I knew, but it never seemed realistic for me. Um, and so... Uh, how can we say to people, here is actually what the top of the salary range is, and we, we're just going to give it to you. We're not going to make you sort of grovel and beg uh, to get there, or that person B gets it because they knew to ask, and person A doesn't get it because they didn't know or didn't feel comfortable asking based on the uh, identities that they hold. And so uh, I would just encourage folks, if you're a job searcher uh, or seeker, to ask those questions, to negotiate for yourself, to talk to people, to coach yourself up and feel confident doing that. And if you're a job hire, how do you make that process transparent and not complicated for folks or not privileged folks who come from certain identities and not other identities uh, in that process? Um, and post your salaries. Like that'd be really helpful for people if you could just do that. <laughs> <laughs> be upfront about it. Yes. Right. Um, and so even as I hear that, Sanjit, how do you be upfront about it so that even the seeker doesn't have to go through all of that? Yes. Like that to me, Kathy, is a systems change. Yes. Can you imagine if in the mission and vision they say we're wanting to create an inclusive to dismantle racism, classroom, classism, other forms of oppression, and we're not there yet. We want to recruit folks who can help us. Mm -hmm. Who knows? You start asking for what the skills and competencies are. Just a moment left. Sanja, how can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so folks can uh, find me via my email, which is my name, Sanja Ardwin uh, at gmail.com. So S-O-N-J-A-A-R-D-O-I-N at gmail.com. My website, which is www.sanjaardwin.com or on Twitter, I'm at, at Sanja Ardwin as my handle. Final thoughts, Dr. Becky Martinez. Thank you. Like, thank you so much for um, being you in this space and talking about it from the individual to the systems level. And my hope is, is that people um, can reflect and think about, huh, how does it show up and how I supervise or how I lead or how I create a policy or a practice or how I talk about it with my family. Mm -hmm. uh, um, all of those different components um, are part of shifting this class dynamic. So thank you for, for you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for having me. I join in the thank you. I am challenged given my class privilege to be thinking as well in my own practice, but as well as how can I challenge folks to dismantle classism. Um, so everybody just keep breathing. Step by step, we will do this. Transformation Change Radio with Dr. Becky Martinez, Dr. Kathy O'Bear, Dr. Sanja. Thank you so much. Next time we'll be with Dr. Tanya Williams talking about maybe with a bit more of a nonprofit feel as well. Can't wait. And Tanya works, has worked with class action and I know Becky, you've been on the board. So 
We're just going to keep building our capacity and competency. Till next time, go well and dismantle classism.